Well, good morning, brothers and sisters, and happy Sabbath. I'd like to welcome you all to our, our fellow, Bayswater Fellowship today, Seventh day Adventist Fellowship, and I pray that God will bless us as we continue to look at the three angels' messages, and we'll get straight into it. So I'm just going to share the screen, and uh, Craig has already prayed for us, so let us begin our, our topic for today. So I'd like to uh, again welcome everybody to our Free Angels Messages sermon series. And today is sermon number 22. So once again, we're going to go through these Free Angels Messages and I'm, I'm hoping by the time we finish uh, these, these Free Angels Message presentations, you'll have learnt these Free Angels Messages um, off by heart because they've been said so many times. <laughs> so let's go through it again. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment has come and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon has fallen, has fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up for ever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Revelation 14, 6 to 12. So that is the three angels' messages. And as we have looked at the first angel's message, the everlasting gospel, we see the everlasting gospel calls us to fear God and to give glory to him. The hour of his judgment is come and worship him as our creator. And that is the everlasting gospel, which is the first angel's message. And then we looked at the second angel's message, which says Babylon is fallen. And we saw that this woman, who is a great whore, whose name is Mystery Babylon the Great, is the church that is at Babylon or Rome, or the Church of Rome, the Roman Catholic Church. We saw that gradually over a period of a few centuries, the church in Rome, or Babylon, started becoming corrupt and they departed from the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. They started giving heed to seducing spirits and teaching doctrines of devils, speaking lies. And during the, this uh, part of the presentation, we looked at mystery, Babylon the Great. Death is at the end of us. Messengers from the grave. Sunday, or Lord's Day. And behold, I come as a thief. We saw that the wine of her fornication is the false doctrines of the church that is at Babylon, the Roman Catholic Church, that have been introduced into Christianity by her, some of which we've looked at in those five sermons. And today we will look at one more of these false doctrines of Babylon. So Babylon is fallen. So this is the second angel's message. And then we looked at the third angel's message. It says, if any man worship the beast. And we've so far we've looked at an image, beast, and a little horn. We've looked at the sea beast, looked at the two-horned beast. We saw the battle of Armageddon, and we saw the wrath of Babylon and the wrath of God. Over the last two sermon topics, we have looked at the wrath of Babylon and the wrath of God. We saw the two wraths. God's wrath and Babylon's wrath, one preceding the other and one is the result of the other. The first wrath was from Babylon and then the wrath of God is poured out as a result of Sunday worship, which is the mark of the beast, which is part of the wine of the wrath of Babylon's fornication. 
Of this wrath of God that is poured out as a result of the mark of the beast, we read, and the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image, and it's whoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here we read that as a result of the wrath of God, people will be tormented with fire and brimstone, and that the smoke of their torment of it will ascend or be going up forever and ever. And Jesus says these words in Mark 9, verse 47, And if thy eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. Here we read of hell fire, which is what we will be looking at in this sermon. So the title of my sermon today is called Hell Fire. I'm sure many of you have heard the saying, it's as hot as hell out there. But how hot is hell? Where is it? And most importantly, how long will it last? Is it really a place of eternal torment for the wicked? There is much confusion in the realms of Christianity concerning this, so we must go to the word of God and see what God says about it to get the correct view or the truth. And remember the little saying that we have been using throughout these sermons. What saith the Bible? This my only question be. The teachings of men so often mislead us, but what saith the Bible to me? And the other saying is, what saith the Bible, the blessed Bible to me? The teachings of men so often mislead us, but what saith the Bible to me? Now, let us look into this all-important topic. It's so important because there are millions of people who hate God because of this teaching of eternally burning hell. But before we look at the scriptures, let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we have been going through the three angels' messages. And today we are going to look at another very important subject, dear Lord, the subject of hellfire. What is it, dear Lord? Is it really eternal? What does your word say about it? I pray as we begin this study that your Holy Spirit will bless us, that he will lead us and guide us through your scriptures to give us wisdom and understanding and help us to know the truth of the matter so we will not be deceived and have a wrong understanding of who you are and of your will for mankind. So bless us now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, let us begin. The most fearful threatening ever addressed to mortals is contained in the third angel's message, which speaks of the wine of the wrath of God, which we read before. There are two phrases here that I want us to focus on. They are forever and ever and fire and brimstone. And I believe that once we've established from the scriptures alone what these two phrases mean, we will get a correct understanding of how fire so how long is forever and ever? In Jonah chapter 2, verse 6, we read, I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with the bars was about me forever. Yet that hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. Just give me a minute. I've got the sun shining in my eyes, so I'm just going to move this computer a little bit so it's not shining as much in my eyes. That's better. I can see the screen better now. So according to Jonah, he was in the belly of the whale forever. How long was he in there for? In Jonah 1 verse 17, it says, Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And Jesus also mentioning the history of Jonah says, for as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, 
so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Matthew 12, verse 40. Both he, that's Jonah, and Jesus said it was three days. So does that mean forever and ever is only three days? Let us continue reading. In 1 Samuel 22, oh, sorry, chapter 1, verse 22 and 28, we read this. But Hannah went not up, for she said unto her husband, I will not go up until the child be weaned, and then I will bring him, bring him that he may appear before the Lord and there abide forever. Therefore also have I lent him unto the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord. And he worshipped the Lord there. That's Samuel. So Hannah gave Samuel to appear before the Lord forever. And then she says, for as long as he liveth. Now Samuel lived for 59 years. So does that mean forever and ever is only 59 years? Let us continue reading. Speaking of David's royal line, God said, And King Solomon shall be blessed, and the throne of David shall be established before the Lord forever. 1 Kings 2, verse 45. God said David's royal line on the throne in Jerusalem would be established forever. Yet from the time of their Babylonian captivity in the year 608 BC, there has never been a king upon David's throne in Jerusalem. David's royal line on the throne in Jerusalem only lasted around 400 years. So does that mean forever and ever is only 400 years? Sorry, I've got 14 there. It should be 400 years. These are just a few examples that I could show you. So according to the Bible, how long is forever and ever? Is it three days or 59 years or 400 years? No, forever and ever is only as long as it lasts. Now let us look at the phrase fire and brimstone. In Psalm 11, verse 6, we read, Upon the wicked he shall rain snares, fire and brimstone, and an horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup. When did the Lord first use fire and brimstone to punish the wicked? In Genesis 19, 24 and 25, we read this. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah, brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and that which grew upon the ground. In Luke 17, verse 29, Jesus says, But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Now, you know, some Christians teach that Sodom and Gomorrah never really existed and that they were just stories. But here we see Jesus referring to these events as being factual. The Apostle Peter says, And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemn them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly. 2 Peter 2 and verse 6. And now let us read what Jude says. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh or homosexuality, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire, Jude verse 7. Now these are some interesting verses. According to Peter and Jude, these cities suffered as an example of the reward of the immoral and the wicked and ungodly, fire and brimstone or eternal fire. Now, I have a question. Are Sodom and Gomorrah burning now? No. What is Sodom and Gomorrah now? These ancient cities have been discovered and they are exactly what the Bible said they are, ashes. Now, according to the third angel's message, the wicked will be punished with fire and brimstone. But when will this actually 
take place. Let us look at a few verses. Revelation 19, verse 20. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that had worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire, burning with brimstone. Revelation 19, verse 20. Revelation 20, verse 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and they shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Revelation 21, verse 8. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters all ha and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. We see here from these verses that this lake of fire and brimstone does not actually occur until around the time of the second coming of Jesus and thereafter. We will see more of this as we continue. But let us look at some more examples of history. Jesus says, And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Mark 9, verses 43 and 44. Here, Jesus speaks of what is called an unquenchable fire. Does this mean eternal fire? Now, God said through the prophet Jeremiah to rebellious Judah and Israel these words. But if you will not hearken unto me to hallow the Sabbath day and not to bear any burden, even entering in at the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, then will I kindle a fire in the gates thereof, and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem, and it shall not be quenched. Jeremiah 17, 27. Now, according to the popular concept of hell, it will be an unquenchable fire burning forever and ever. However, the city of Jerusalem suffered an unquenchable fire around 2,600 years ago. Is Jerusalem burning now? No. Unquenchable is a fire that cannot be put out before it has consumed everything that can burn. This cell fire will finally go out when there is nothing left to burn. Now, what is interesting to note about this unquenchable fire that came upon Jerusalem was because they did not hallow the Sabbath day. And what is the reason for the fire and brimstone today? Because people are keeping Sunday and do not hallow the Sabbath day. Now, some people teach and believe that hellfire is somewhere way below the surface of this earth. But where will it actually be? The Bible says, Behold, the righteous shall be recompensed in the earth, much more the wicked and the sinner. Proverbs 11, verse 31. Here Solomon says that both the righteous and the wicked will receive their recompense or reward in the earth. Now, speaking of Satan, the Old Testament says, Fear in the pit and the snare are upon thee, O inhabitants of the earth. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord will, shall punish the hosts of the high ones that are on high and the kings of the earth upon the earth. Isaiah 24, verses 17 and 21. Now Jude says this, And the angels which kept not their first estate but left their own habitation, he hath reserved, in everlasting chains under darkness unto the day of the great, the judgment of the great day, Jude verse 6. So Satan and his angels, the hosts of the high ones on high, will also be punished upon the earth at the judgment of the great day. And Peter says, 
But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Second Peter 3 and verse 7. So according to these verses, the wicked, both of ungodly men and angels, will be punished upon the earth in the fire of the day of judgment and perdition. Now, when will that fire be? The word of God says, going back to 2 Peter 3, verses 10 and 12, but the day of the Lord will come as the thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heaven being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. And in Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 and 8, Paul says, When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 8, it says, And then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. So here we can plainly see that this fire begins at the second coming of Jesus. So according to these verses of the Bible, how fire has not yet happened. And it will go out when there is nothing left to burn. Now, this takes place at the beginning of the millennium. And then after the millennium, we read in Revelation 20, verses 1 to 3 and verse 5, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into a bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. But the rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. At the beginning of the millennium or the thousand years, Satan is bound. He can no longer deceive because there is no one left on earth but him and his angels. The saved are in heaven and the wicked are dead. But after the millennium, we read this. In, and when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and he shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. Revelation 20, verses 7 and 8. Where are the wicked to be gathered together to battle? We read in Revelation 16, verse 16, and he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. So this is the culmination of the Battle of Armageddon, which started just prior to the second coming of Jesus, when the nations of the earth in union with the papacy and apostate Protestantism were gathered together to war against Jesus in the person of his saints through the enforcement of the papal Sunday law upon the inhabitants of the earth in order to persecute and put to death those who remain faithful to God's true seventh-day Sabbath. And all this was done under the direction of Satan, that first great apostate who deceived the world even to the point of personating Christ himself. But Jesus' second coming put a temporary stop to this war. But after the thousand years are expired and the wicked are resurrected from their graves, Satan then goes out to deceive the nations once more to gather them together for this last great war in the Battle of Armageddon. So the apostate general gathers together all the unsaved mighty warriors of earth throughout the ages, men and women whose lives were full of wickedness, despotism and hatred. 
and use their power to wield, control and kill millions upon millions of innocent people, all because of their lust and greed and power, all their false and fanatical ideologies or religious beliefs. Men like Hitler, Pol Pot, Idi Amin, Stalin, ISIS, Attila the Hun, Abu Bekr, the many European leaders who were led on by the papacy in the dark ages to kill God's people, the Crusaders, Caesar Nero with his mother, Alexander the Great, Sennacherib, Belshazzar, Pharaoh, Nimrod, and the list goes on. Along with the generals and leaders of the world today, who will unite with the church to make war against Sabbath peoples. Now Satan consults with his angels and then with these kings and conquerors and mighty men. They all then gather the lost Gog and Magog into ranks and make weapons of warfare that have been invented throughout the ages and then Satan and his fallen angels lead the march. And we read that they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city. Revelation 20 and verse 9. Satan has so deceived the inhabitants of the earth once again that they can win this conflict against God and Jesus and his people and that they can take the beloved city, the new Jerusalem, by storm and overthrow it and dethrone God once and for all. But as they begin their march and prepare for the strike, something happens. We read, and I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, for whose face the earth and the heavens fled away, and it was found no place for them. Revelation 20, verse 11. All of a sudden, in view of the whole earth, Jesus is seen sitting upon his throne. And the wicked are stopped in their tracks. And then the scriptures say, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to the works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. Revelation 20, 12 and 13. Now, great controversy says, as soon as the books of record are open and the eye of Jesus looks upon the wicked, they are conscious of every sin which they have ever committed. They see just where their feet diverge from the path of purity and holiness Just how far pride and rebellion have carried them in their violation of the law of God. The seductive temptations which they encourage by indulgence in sin. The blessings perverted, the messengers of God despised. The warnings rejected. The waves of mercy beaten back by the stubborn, unrepentant heart. All because of their unfounded hatred of God. Jesus, the Bible, his law, and his people, and their love of sin. Even your reaction to these three angels' messages is being recorded. And Alan White goes on to say, all appear as if written in letters of fire. And they cannot escape their self-condemnation. How dreadful the thought. Every evil thought, word and action of our lives, we will have to meet again on that day. If we do not repent and confess our sins and accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Saviour. What a solemn thought, my friends. This event is the culmination of the judgment of that great day that began at the second coming of Jesus. The executive judgment and sentence that will be irrevocably pronounced upon the wicked. At this time is seen in panoramic view of all the inhabitants of the universe, the history of the great controversy. From the time of Lucifer's first lie and his leading a third of the angels into rebellion with him, to the fall of man and the great flood, from the Tower of Babel and the beginning of idolatry, to Moses and God writing the Ten Commandments on the tables of stone, 
and the setting up of the nation of Israel. And from there, the failure of Israel to represent God to the world and their idolatry, which led to their captivity in Babylon. And a subsequent returning to their land in preparation for the first coming of the Messiah. And then he's seen the life of Jesus, the Son of God, from his birth to his tireless ministry to uplift man from the ruin of sin and false teachings. And then his struggle in the Garden of Gethsemane, where the destiny of mankind hung in the balance, to the shocking treatment he suffered at his trial and death. Then he's seen his glorious resurrection and ascension to heaven to sit at the right hand of God, to be our elder brother, intercessor, and great high priest. And then he's seen the war that was waged against the messengers of the gospel over the last 2,000 years. We see the evil priests and leaders of Israel who were always on the track of the disciples of Jesus and led other people to think that they were wicked people and put them to death. We see the wicked Nero and the other Roman emperors throwing Christians to the lions in the Colosseum to the cheers of the Roman throng and their persecution of them through the early centuries. We see the wicked leaders of false religions like Hindus and Buddhists that murdered the heralds of the gospel to Asia to free people from those degrading religions. We see the rise of the papacy and the millions of Christians that were ordered to be killed by pompous popes, popes who profess to be the followers of the Prince of Peace. Around the same time, we see the rise of Mohammedanism and the millions of Christians that have been killed by that false religion. And then a little closer to our day, we see the rise of atheism, whose ideology culminates in socialism or communism, and the millions of Christians over the last century or so that have been killed by this power in the former USSR, China, and other communist countries. And then looking forward into the future, the persecution that will take place when the church and state are once again united under the threefold union of the Roman Catholic Church, apostate Protestantism, and spiritualism. And the countless lives that will be taken because Christians will refuse to give up their fidelity to God and his word and his law, especially the seventh-day Sabbath, and refuse to receive the mark of the beast Sunday worship. Again, the great controversy 668. And just before I read this quote, I also want to mention it's not just the history of Bible, Bible history that we see, we will see, but also all the other nations of the world that went into idolatry and 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 um and all the results of that and how God tried to bring the, the gospel or to bring the truth to these these um, other nations of the world, they will see all these things happen as well. So it's going to be a long, a long uh, history lesson. And then the great controversy 668 says this, the whole wicked world stand arraigned at the bar of God on the charge of high treason against the government of heaven. They have none to plead their cause. They are without excuse. Throughout this whole scene, everybody's eye is affixed to the view. Every part that the lost have played in the role is vividly etched in their conscience. And again, they cannot turn away from it or efface it from their memory. It is now evident to all that the wages of sin is not noble independence and eternal life, but slavery, ruin and death. Again, what a solemn thought, my friends. And finally, after the scene is completed, the words of Paul will be fulfilled. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things of earth and things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Philippians 2 verse 10 and 11. In Jude 14 and 15, it says that Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with 10,000 of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds 
which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. The wicked see that they have forfeited by their life of rebellion. Sorry, the wicked see what they have forfeited by their life of rebellion. The far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory was despised when offered them. The glories of the hereafter was despised when offered them, but now they see the holy city in all its splendour and the redeemed whom they mocked and persecuted for their faithfulness safe inside, clothed with life, health, immortality and eternal joy. But how desirable it now appears. All this, cries the lost soul, I might have had, but I chose to put these things far from me. O strange infatuation, I have exchanged peace, happiness and honour for wretchedness, infamy and despair. All see that that their exclusion from heaven is just. By their lives they have declared, we will not have this man, Jesus, to reign over us. And once the irrevocable sentence has been pronounced upon the wicked, Satan then, going back to the great controversy, page 671 and 672, rushes into the midst of his subjects and endeavours to inspire them with his own fury and to arouse them to instant battle. But of all the countless millions whom he is allured into rebellion, there are none now to acknowledge his supremacy. His power is at an end. Hallelujah. Amen. The wicked are filled with the same hatred of God that inspired Satan. But they see that their case is hopeless, that they cannot prevail against Jehovah. Their rage is kindled against Satan and those who have been his agents in deception. And with the fury of demons, they turn upon them. Now, brothers and sisters, Ellen White says, no pen can fully describe these scenes. And I pray none of us will be a part of that. But as this work of revenge and slaughter goes on, the Bible says, Fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Revelation 20 and verse 9. And again, going back to this verse, we looked at in Psalm 11, verse 6. It says, Upon the wicked he shall rain snares or quick burning coals, fire and brimstone and a horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup. Fire comes down from God out of heaven. The earth is broken up. The weapons concealed in its depth are drawn forth. The elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. 2 Peter 3 and verse 10. Devouring flames burst forth from the yawning, every yawning chasm. The very rocks are on fire. The day has come that shall burn as an oven. The earth's surface seems one molten mass, a vast seething lake of fire. Great Controversy 672 and 673. The day has come, the day of the Lord's vengeance and the year of recompense for the controversy of Zion. Psalm 34 and verse 8. It is a time of the judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Great Controversy 673. In Malachi 4 verse 1, we read, For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be as stubborn. And the day shall cometh that shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. Some are destroyed as in a moment, while others suffer many days. All are punished according to their deeds. Satan's punishment is to be far greater than those of whom he is deceived. After all have perished who fell by his deceptions, he is still to live and suffer on. In the cleansing flames, the wicked are at last destroyed, root and branch, 
Satan the root, his followers the branches. The full penalty of the law has been visited. The demands of justice have been met. And heaven and earth beholding declare the righteousness of Jehovah. Malachi 4 verse 3 says, And ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. And they shall become as ashes. Revelation 20, verses 14 and 15, we read, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Finally, Satan's work of ruin is forever ended. For 6,000 years he has wrought his will, filling the earth with woe and causing grief throughout the universe. The whole creation has groaned and travailed together in pain. Now God's creatures are forever delivered from his presence and temptations. Isaiah 14 verse 7 says, The whole earth is at rest and is quiet. They, the righteous, break forth into sin. And the Bible says, What do you imagine against the Lord? He will make an utter end. Affliction shall not rise up the second time. Nahum 1 and verse 9. The great controversy is ended. Sin and sinners are no more. Great controversy 678. The scripture says that the wicked, that they shall be as though they had not been. Obadiah verse 16. And again, Nahum 1, oh, sorry, this is Nahum 1, sorry. It says, shall... The wicked shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. I think that is, um, that's first, second, first Thessalonians. Sorry about that. I'll have to get that verse properly again. Ellen White goes on to say in Great Controversy 674, the fire that consumes the wicked purifies the earth. Every trace of the curse is swept away. Every trace of the three curses pronounced to Adam, Cain, and Noah upon the, our earth is now gone. And then it's, it goes on to say in the great controversy, no eternally burning hell will be kept, will keep before the ransom the fearful consequences of sin. One remainder alone, reminder alone remains. Our Redeemer will ever bear the marks of his crucifixion. Upon his wounded head, upon his side, his hands and feet are the only traces of the cruel work that sin has wrought. Says the prophet Habakkuk, beholding Jesus Christ in his glory, he had horns or bright beams coming out of his side and there was the hiding of his power. Habakkuk 3 and verse 4. And remember, Jesus said, Depart from me, ye curse, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Matthew 25, verse 41. The everlasting fire is prepared for the devil and his angels, not for human beings. Not one of us need to be in it. But Satan longs for us to ultimately die with him in the lake of fire or the second death and be eternally separated from God. This is why he wants to deceive us about God's character, Jesus, the truth of the Bible, his people, and these messages, leading you to hate him so you don't accept the eternal life that Jesus died to give you. And unfortunately, Satan has deceived many Christians into this false understanding of hellfire. So the question must be asked, if this is not biblical, how did it get into Christianity? It was introduced into Christianity from paganism by the Roman Catholic Church or Babylon, and it is part of the wine of her fornication, her false doctrines. Now, I want to share something interesting on this point. 
This false understanding of hellfire or everlasting fire is the reason why the Protestant Reformation began. Now let me explain. Connected with this teaching of hellfire are the doctrines of limbo, where children who are not baptised into Catholicism go, and purgatory, where some others go, either Catholic or non-Catholic. And this is determined by the Catholic priest. Now, in order for someone to get out of either limbo or purgatory, the living have to pay a fee, or what the Roman Catholic Church calls indulgences. Now, back in the 1500s, a Catholic prelate or a high order of priests, he was actually a Dominican monk by the name of Tetzel, by order of the Pope, was travelling around Germany selling these indulgences in order to raise money for the church to build a new cathedral in Rome. And that was St Peter's Basilica in the Vatican, that iconic building. In Great Controversy 127, we read this. The Roman church had made merchandise of the grace of God. Under the plea of raising funds for the erection of St Peter's Church at Rome, indulgences for sin were publicly offered for sale by the authority of the Pope. By the price of crime, a temple was to be built up for God's worship. The cornerstone lay with the wages of iniquity. So that building, you see, that iconic building, the the Vatican building was built and by money raised through indulgences and also other money as well. Now, the infamous traffic was set up by the, in the church and Tetzel, ascending the pulpit, extolled the indulgences as the most precious gift of God. Wow. <laughs> what happened to Jesus as being the most precious gift of God? He declared that by virtue of his certificates of pardon, all the sins which the purchaser should afterward desire to commit would be forgiven him, and that not even repentance is necessary. More than this, he assured his hearers that the indulgences had power to save not only living but the dead, that the very moment the the money should clink against the bottom of his chest, the soul in whose behalf it had been paid would escape from purgatory and make its way to heaven. But the very means adopted for Rome's aggrandizement provoked the deadliest blow to her power and greatness. It was this that aroused the most determined and successful of the enemies of popery and led to the battle which shook the papal throne and jostled the triple crown from the pontiff's head. So what happened? When these brought or bought indulgences were presented to the then Catholic priest Martin Luther, he refused to accept these indulgences and told his congregation that the just shall live by faith, Romans 1.17, and that they need the blood of Jesus Christ to forgive them 1 John 1, 7 and 9, and that purgatory was a lie. And this was when Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the church door in 1517, and thus began the Protestant Reformation. But sadly, it was not let go of by many of the Protestant churches during the Reformation. And today, many Protestant churches still use this diabolical false doctrine of hellfire to put fear into people to get them to serve God. And thus the mother Babylon and her children, the apostate Protestant churches, the harlots, are perpetuating this fiendish lie of the papacy. And this is why it is found within Christianity today. Now, before we bring this message to a close, I want to bring out one more point concerning Babylon and hellfire. As I stated in the previous sermon and partly in this one, Jesus said that the everlasting fire is prepared for the devil and his angels, not for human beings. None of us need to be in it. So too, the seven last plagues are her or Babylon's plagues, not anyone else's. Again, 
None of us need to be a part of it. And also in the third angel's message, we read of the smoke of the torment of those who worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead and his whoever receiveth the mark of his name. But whose actually is the smoke of their torment? We read, when they shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off for the fear of her torment. Revelation 18, 9 and 10. It is the smoke of her or Babylon, the papacy's burning. It is her torment. And also, sorry, and as we also have seen in previous sermons, the papacy is called Satan's seat, where he dwelleth and rules the world from. It is the synagogue of Satan, his church on earth, where he speaks his doctrine from, the doctrine of devils. Speaking to the Jews, Jesus said, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. John 8, verse 44. And what are the lusts, or what are Satan's lusts? He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. In John 10 and verse 10, it says, The thief, Satan, cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. And is not this the case with Babylon, the Roman Catholic Church? Is she a liar? Yes, she is. She speaks false doctrines. Is she a murderer? Yes, she is. In her was found the blood of all that was slain upon the earth. Does she steal and destroy? Yes, she does. She attempts to take away eternal life from people and to take the people away from Jesus. And because of this Babylon, the Roman Catholic Church wants you to receive of her seven last plagues and to be a part of the smoke of her burning, her torment, in the lake of fire and brimstone or hellfire and ultimately be in the everlasting fire that is prepared for the devil and his angels, which is the second death. So you will be destroyed with them and miss out on eternal life. But as I stated before, none of us need to be a part of any of these evil plans. So we've been looking today at the subject of hellfire. Well, my friends, we have seen throughout this sermon that this diabolical doctrine of eternal torment in hellfire is a liar, Satan, designed to get you to hate God and think of him as mean and unloving. But instead, we have seen who is the mean and unloving one, Satan, the one who wants you to be with him in that lake of fire, which is the second death, so you will not have the eternal life that Jesus died for you to have and cease to exist like him and be as though you had not been. In our next sermon, we will continue to look at this doctrine of hellfire and look at some very interesting verses, some of which seem to support this doctrine and see what they really mean by comparing Scripture with Scripture so we can come up with the truth of the matter and not believe a lie of Satan. Now, on this point, it won't be in our next sermon. It will be in um, the, a sermon at, at 2.30. So just keep that in mind. In closing, this is what the Bible says of what God thinks about the final work of executive judgment and hellfire. On Isaiah 28, verses 21 to 23, Jesus says this, For the Lord shall rise up as in Mount Perizim, he shall be wroth as in the valley of Gibeon, that he may do his work, his strange work, and bring to pass his act, his strange act. Now, therefore, be ye not mockers, lest your bands be made strong. For I have heard from the Lord of hosts, Lord God of hosts, the consumption, even determined upon the whole earth. Give ye ear, 
and hear my voice, hearken and hear my speech. The Bible says that to our merciful God, this act or work of punishment or consumption is a strange act. It's something that he doesn't want to do. And this is why he pleads with us to hear his voice and hearken to his speech. And what does he say? Ezekiel 18, verses 31 and 32. Cast away from you all your transgressions, whereby you have transgressed, and make you a new heart and a new spirit. For why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, saith the Lord God. Wherefore, turn yourselves and live ye. And in 2 Peter 3, verse 9, it says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, Lord, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I want to share with you these words of the Bible, which is God's desire for each and every human being, for you and I. Esther 8 verse 6 says, For how can I, that is God, we know this is S, um, S is saying this, but think of it in the grand scheme of the great controversy. This is God speaking here. For how can I endure to see the evil that shall come up to my people? Or how can I endure to see the destruction of my kindred? Yes, my friends, Jesus, our elder brother and advocate in heaven, cannot endure to see you destroyed in hellfire. He wants you to be saved to everlasting life with him. But it's your choice. It's my choice. Will you continue in the pleasures of sin for a season and then perish? Or will you cease to do evil and learn to do well and live forever in eternal life? God says to you, see, I have set before thee this day life and good and death and evil. Deuteronomy 30, verse 15. I pray, my friends, that you will choose life and good. For he says in Deuteronomy 30, verse 19, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life, that both thou and thy seed may live. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come before your throne of grace this morning, your grace, throne of mercy, and what mercy you have bestowed upon us as human beings, dear Father. While we were sinners, you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to die for us to deliver us from the power of Satan, to save us from the everlasting destruction that is going to come upon the wicked, especially upon Satan and his angels. And Heavenly Father, it is not your will that any of us be destroyed in this lake of fire or brimstone or hellfire. But you want us all to come to repentance and have everlasting life with you. And we know that Satan has this false doctrine that we've been looking at today. And he, he wants to deceive many, if not all, so that we are not part of that eternal life that you have for us. And so, Lord, help us to understand the truth of the matter. Thank you for revealing this to us in your word. And I pray that you will bless this presentation, that those who will hear it, will have a correct understanding of this message, this truth, and so that they will not no longer hate you and have a misrepresentation of your character. They will see that you are a God of love, mercy and justice, but you will not, in no means clear the guilty. So help us to be on the right side, dear Lord. Help us to choose life. Help us to serve you with all our heart, mind, soul and strength so that when Jesus comes, we will be part of that group that will have the eternal life that Jesus died to give them. So bless us now, dear Lord, and thank you for hearing this prayer. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 
Okay. Just the recording.